As many of you all already know, we live in a fragmented region. And because we are in a seminary here today, I wanted to tie it to some popular scriptures. I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and whether that's your theology or you don't have a theology at all, I believe there's something altruistic in all of us that has compassion for other people. And so today I want to talk about how fragmentation affects us individually, how it affects the small communities that we live in, that we call municipalities, and how it affects our greater region. So we have this question of who is your neighbor? Well, it comes from a scripture in Mark where God clearly outlines that the greatest commandments above all are to love God with everything and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, later on in Luke, there is a legal expert who asks, how do I inherit eternal, uh, eternal life? And then it comes up, these same two principles, love God with everything and then love your neighbor as yourself. Well then, he asks the clarifying question, or maybe she asks the clarifying question, who is my neighbor? So I want you to think about that. As we talk about fragmentation today, who is your neighbor? Jesus goes on to share the parable of the Good Samaritan. As you know, that someone, or you may not know, someone who was traveling, was robbed, left on the side of the road. Two individuals walked past him, first a priest and a Levite, and then there was the Samaritan who saw him, tended to him, shared his resources so that he can heal. So as we think about these scriptures or we think about these principles in the Bible, how are they related to the sense of fragmentation? Well, first, let's define fragmentation. It's, divine, it's defined by the number of governmental units in a given area. In our region, that's 89 municipalities. And that is just in St. Louis County alone. So before I talk about how this affects us as a region, I want to go back to my research that uh, Steve alluded to, and that is this research around trauma recovery. I looked at it specifically through the lens of small businesses, and the reason I chose small businesses is because they are vital to communities. And during the unrest that started in Ferguson and Delwood in August of 2014, they were perhaps the most affected by it. We saw images of them being looted, vandalized on TV. And as I got into the community almost two years later to talk to these businesses, I saw the emotional, the physical, and the financial effects on them. So I studied what their business needs were. I looked at how the community reacted to what their business needs were. And ultimately, I looked at what influenced their decision to stay in their communities post-riot trauma. And I found four things. The first one was stability. If a business was already unstable, the unrest was the nail in the coffin. They were not able to stay afloat. The second one was community support. So the funding was very popular at that time and people were donating to various businesses. And I truly believe this is because everybody saw what was going on and they wanted to do something. They just didn't know what. Um, and this also doesn't take away from the expertise that so many people share with these businesses to get them back on their feet. But to be honest, some of the businesses that got the most support weren't necessarily the businesses that needed it the most. Not to say that they didn't need it, but a business with a broken window could get $10,000 more than a business that had completely burned to the ground. So community support was critical. Then access to resources. So if they were able to get uh, facade loans or grants, that was great, but they also had to already have some of their business in order, their records in order, have certain credit scores, and sometimes that was a barrier to, to businesses that they tried to sort of reestablish themselves. And the fourth one was hope. How did they see the communities that they were living in? How did they see them moving forward? And were they optimistic about it? And did they see themselves as a part of it? Now, one of the most interesting things that I learned about Ferguson, and how many people 
people knew where Ferguson was before all of this occurred. And if you lived in Ferguson, put your hand down. Um, but if you were outside, you live outside of Ferguson. How many people knew where Ferguson was? Still a really good amount of people. I grew up in Bellmore, drove through Ferguson all the time on South Horseton Road, did not know what Ferguson was. I'm going to be completely honest with you and talk to a lot of people about it. What I learned was Ferguson has very two very different communities on the South Horseton side and the West Horseton side. So South Horseton, historically a 10th district, um, they have an established long-standing business association which sell taxes, they choose to do that, and it's great because they can have community events, they have um, a farmer's market, they have a run, they have concerts, all of these great things. Sit-down restaurants, they have more home buyers, and it's managed by Ferguson. On the West Florida side, it hasn't historically been a tip district. The business association was not established until after the unrest, and it's still struggling to stabilize. Um, it's a thoroughfare, so tens of thousands of cars come through that corridor each day. And then they have more renters. And then just along that corridor, you have three municipalities. You have Ferguson, you have Delwood, and you have Jennings. You're thinking, why does this matter? Well, when we talk about recovery, when we talk about rebuilding areas, dealing with three different municipalities that have their own ordinances, they have their own zoning, they have their own governance, that becomes a bit of an issue. It makes it more of a challenge. So this is just within one municipality in St. Louis. So let's see what it looks like when we have 89. 89 municipalities that are governing themselves have various resources. Now you may think you love your municipality. I see the I Love Ferguson signs all the time and I think it's great to love your community. But we also have to be real about how and why these municipalities were established. They were established to protect the resources of others and keep other people out. These are a few uh, quotes that just sort of exemplify this. So one is from Purple City Planners back in 1940, and it says it would be much more desirable for all of the colored families to be grouped in one major section. Kirkwood is 6% black today. So then you can read the other two. I'm not a fan of reading what's already on the screen. Um, but you can read the other two, and they support this idea that these municipalities were really created as enclaves. Enclaves to protect the resources of others, leaving some people without resources. So as you think about that, and you think about your municipality, and you think about fragmentation, who do you consider as your neighbor? <laughs> this is what fragmentation in government looks like. 55 police departments, 74 municipal courts, 89 municipalities, and 200 plus special taxing districts. This is 52,000 pages of ordinances. That's more than the IRS tax. <laughs> That is what we're dealing with. So this type of fragmentation has its effects on us individually and on our municipalities. Today I'm just going to talk about three. The first one is a population loss. So as we think about fragmentation, we think about the trajectory that St. Louis City is on alone, there's been a 5.1% decline over the past 10 years. And you may be thinking, 5.1%, what does that translate to? More than 16,000 people. And it may not be much to you, but it's a trend that we're on. So if it continues to go in that direction, what does that mean as we try to attract businesses to our region? What does it mean, that, uh, what does it mean as we try to attract and retain top talent in our region? 
How many people in the room by a show of hands and you're not being recorded, I am, so nobody will see you, has ever thought or said it aloud, I need to leave St. Louis because there are better opportunities elsewhere? Be honest. Yeah, and there are so many people who are not thinking that they're doing it. So we really need to look at our region. What businesses want to move here when they have to deal with various ordinances, various zoning issues, various governments? This is really hindering our ability to look like a unified region. The second one, inefficiencies. So as we have duplicate resources with all of these various municipalities, we're wasting money. We have police departments for municipalities as, as small as Country Club Hills that has 12,000 people and as large as Chesterfield, which has closely 48,000. What would happen if we consolidated these resources, not just to reduce costs, but to ensure that everybody gets the same quality of policing in their area? I was recently talking to someone, as he uh, alluded to, um, as a member of the Better Together Board, she said, you know, I don't like the plan because I don't want to give up knowing my police officer and my level of public safety. I said, that's great, but isn't that something that everybody should be entitled to? Not just those that can afford it. Something to think about. And then, with our municipalities, we have sales tax. Sales tax has been around since 1969, and it accounts for a third of our region's revenue. Now you're probably thinking, what's the big, the big deal with sales tax? Well, we have some of the highest sales tax in the country right here in St. Louis. And it's different depending on the municipality that you're in. Because if you're in the Maryland Heights, or you're in the pair, where you have these beautiful malls that bring in sales tax, 60% of your sales tax can come just from that. So what does that mean for those in those wealthier areas? Lower personal property taxes. What does it mean for those who don't have those type of malls in their area? It means higher property tax, and it means that your municipality could try to get that extra revenue from municipal court fees and fines, which is what we saw that was uncovered in 2014. Right here, I actually have a graph that shows you the trend. I'm going to step away from the microphone. As you see, this is where sales tax is higher in revenue, and you see where property tax goes. And you see the relationship right there. It's not one that's parallel. So when I talk about disparities, these maps help illustrate it more. The top left shows educational disparities. The second one shows where African Americans are mostly concentrated. The third one shows medium household income disparities. The fourth and fifth one are actually focused on health disparities. But the fifth one shows life expectancy by zip code. And the last one shows property tax and the percentages that people pay. And just to illustrate that a little bit more, in De Pair, 60% of your revenue comes from um, sales tax, while in Pine Lawn, at one time, 67% came from court fines and fees. So we know all of this. My question is, it's been going on for so long, are we comfortable with fragmentation? Are we comfortable with the adverse effects of fragmentation? And if we are, how does that align with our principle of who is our neighbor and loving our neighbor? I believe loving our neighbor means to care about them the same way we care about ourselves, to make sure that they have the same resources that we have. As this slide before shows, it's not you don't get what you can afford because you're paying a higher percentage of sales tax, of, of personal property tax, but you live in areas with resources that are not, that, that are not as good, that don't have the same quality. So I ask again, are we comfortable with fragmentation? And if we're not, 
<laughs> what are we going to do? Because honestly, I believe, as we think about who our neighbor is, it's not just the person who lives next door to us or on the block with us or the person who shares our values, lives the same lifestyle as us, or is in the same tax bracket. So it's people in Pine Lawn, it's the people in Wilson, it's the people across this region. Because when we leave this region and somebody asks us where we're from, we don't say, I'm from Illinois. We say we're from St. Louis. That means that we're all connected. And if we could learn nothing else from what happened in Ferguson and Delwood and parts of Jennings, we learned that one of what happens in one area affects all of us in some way. Whether it's the branding of this region, whether it's our inability to get to work, or whether we're a business owner and people are no, no longer coming to our neighborhoods and afraid to shop. So one of the things I want to talk about today, if we're uncomfortable with fragmentation, what do we do? How do we think about this? And now, I open it up for conversation. 